Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for joining today for um, what I feel is a really important conversation. And uh, this, uh, for those of you who have joined us for the first time, is another of one of our series of the Deep Transformation Network live interactive conversations. And this is where um, members of the network have the opportunity to be in direct contact with at least some of the world's groundbreaking pioneers uh, working to try to redirect our civilization um, and to ask them the questions that really matter uh, to, uh, to all of us. And today I'm just, I'm honored and delighted to be in conversation with two of the leading executives of the Club of Rome. Uh, Dr. Manfela Ranfele and Carlos Alvarez Pereira. And, um, uh, and um, Dr. Ma Dr. Ranfele is the co-president of the Club of Rome. And she's had an illustrious career as a global public servant. She was a founding trustee of the Nelson Mandela Foundation and among many other prominent positions. She um, she's, uh, was vice chancellor of the University of Cape Town and she's been a Managing Director of the World Bank. And Carlos Pereira is Vice President of the Club of Rome. And he's a senior professional combining more than 30 years of experience in research and in innovation and entrepreneurship and business management. And he's also on the advisory board of the International Bateson Institute and fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science. So welcome uh, to you both, man, fellow and Carlos. I'm just so gratified to have you here today with us here on the network. And so let's turn to the topic we'll be talking about today. Basically, as many of you know, 50 years ago now, the Club of Rome commissioned uh, a team of scientists from MIT to develop really the world's first systematic view of future scenarios for the entire world. And their report, of course, is now a classic, the limits to growth. And at the time it shocked the world by projecting that unless there were drastic changes made, we were on track for a global collapse of our civilization sometime in the 21st century. And we now know mainstream economists and politicians spent years trying to falsely discredit their findings. And here we are 50 years later, and we're actually on track right now to the scenario that they projected leading to that potential collapse. So what we need to talk about today is what's been learned from the experiences of these last five decades? Why has that dominant system maintained this trajectory uh, leading us to this terrifying like uh, pathway? And how can we use the lessons of the past, most importantly, to actually inform really effective strategies now to intervene and redirect our civilization? So uh, what I'd like to do is really start with kind of the obvious question, I guess, and maybe I can turn to you, ma'am fellow, to begin with is, why did the world ignore the warning? Why here 50 years later, are we still on this path towards the very collapse scenario that was uh, one of that, that primary scenario of that model? So welcome, Manfell, let's hear your thoughts. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. Uh, the point is the world did not ignore mm -hmm. the report. The world found the report inconvenient, Mm. uncomfortable and against what they regarded as their better interests. Mm. Let's remember that there was at the time of the release of the report, a project that had been on the go since 1947 of the Montpellier group, mm. a group of real dedicated economic thinkers and uh, philosophers and uh, people who, who had political influence, mm -hmm. they understood that if they do not come together and mobilize for support for their ideas, mm -hmm. then they will lose the dominance and the benefits of the extractive uh, financialized economic system that they enjoyed the fruits of for so long. Mm -hmm. So the lesson to be learned there is that we as the people 
let's say the good people who were talking about the limits to growth. We did right. not go beyond the facts. Facts don't change history. Mm -hmm. It is when you touch people's emotions that they become passionate at either defending the status quo or fighting for a new way forward. We didn't do enough of that. In fact, we didn't do that at all because mm -hmm. what was one of the weaknesses of the limits to growth is, is total silence on issues of governance and structures of mm -hmm. dominance and power. Whereas this group, the Montpellier group, was all about that. They understood the power of influence and the power of having the right structures, the right leaders in place so that you can govern towards your interests. Mm -hmm. So the lesson is very clear mm -hmm. that we need to go beyond just restating the facts, mm -hmm. but be able to advocate for a reimagined future which touches people's inner feelings, their emotions and their passions, and that connects them to something that they can regard as a desirable outcome. Mm. And so I think we have to learn mm -hmm. to be beyond what they call the Viennese cafe, where we, we kind of uh, congratulate one another about our beautiful papers. But the question is, how do we generate ideas and communicate them in a way that touch people. Mm -hmm. And this is why I think the Club of Rome today is much more into the idea of exploring mm -hmm. how do new ways of thinking emerge and what needs to be done to promote the emergence of new ways of thinking about values, what is of value mm -hmm. and what is valuable and how do you mobilize people around that? Wow, yes, that makes so much sense. And thanks for bringing us right into this central question. Uh, and also that contrast with the Mont Pelerin society because as um, there was the, this article that was shared on the network that I know that you've been sharing uh, or, um, among your own group at the Club of Rome, contrasting that difference between that very organized uh, um, sort of Mont Pelerin society strategy, uh, that sort of Hayek uh, was to sort of build and cultivate network of opinion shapers around the world. Um, and that's what they accomplished. And we've seen, in fact, the rise of neoliberalism rather than this move towards a more sustainable economy. So uh, over to you, Carlos, because I know that you have um, and I read your um, chapter in the in the book that recently got published, looking at exactly these questions. I, I know that you have a number of thoughts about just this process that Manfala has been describing. So I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Yes, yeah, thank you, Jeremy. My my chapter is titled "Learning What We Already Know," mm. and mm. I think it's fundamental. In, the, in this book um, titled Limits and Beyond, which, just, mm -hmm. which was just published, it's the latest report to the Club of Rome. And of course it is on the occasion of the 50th anniversary, a collective work of reflections by many members of the club, but also non-members, including uh, two of the authors of the original book, Dennis Meadows and Jorgen Randers. We ask ourselves this question, you know, uh, the, the, this question of what happened, why didn't we learn, and where do we go from here, you know, where do we go now? And I think the word learning is is essential. Uh, many, uh, not, not many people know that, um, or very few, I would guess, people know that seven years after the limits to growth, um, the Club of Rome published a report titled "No Limits to Learning." Mm -hmm. and learning in the strong sense of the term, learning in the sense of um, changing, of changing our behaviors, or changing our patterns uh, individually, but especially collectively. And as a process, which is more or less the questioning of power. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Karl Deutsch many years ago said that learning is the, sorry, power is the ability not to have to learn anything. Mm -hmm. And actually the reaction uh, of power, let's say to the limits to growth was actually very effective in not having to learn uh, mm -hmm. what the limits to growth was proposing, which by the way, uh, was misinterpreted um, and, and framed by the, its adversaries, mm -hmm. among them many of, many of the economic thinkers of the time, not only the neoliberals, I would say, it would not be completely fair because most of uh, schools of economic thinking at the time and still today were very much obsessed about growth. Mm -hmm. uh, growth as a sign of progress and growing in consumption and in GDP as a sign and as the, the, the tool for progress. So the book in that respect was quite uh, disruptive to that belief. Right. And there was a lot of backlash and that backlash framed the book in a way where, which was unfortunately effective, which was to say, oh, this is, these people are publishing a prophecy of doomsday. You know, we, right. we were labeled as doomsdayers. And nobody, I mean, if it was a novel, that could be okay, but it wasn't a novel. It was about reality. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to hear about doomsday, you know, the prophecy of doomsday. It was exactly the contrary of that, in my view. Mm -hmm. It was a book to open the space of possibilities. Right, yes. And to open and to say to people, to humanity, um, we, if, if we continue in the same way of unlimited growth in consumption, uh, if we take that as a proxy for well-being, uh, yes, we will have, we will face serious issues and probably mm -hmm. collapse, mm -hmm. but we can do otherwise. There are possibilities to do, to do otherwise because among the 12 scenarios in the book, in the original book, there were some scenarios in which the balance between well-being, human well-being, and, and the biosphere was achieved. Right. But those were not explored right. at all. And that seem, seems to be the, the key. And that, that, that seems to be a key theme for the lesson that we can learn and how we can adopt a different strategy. Basically, the whole movement for transformation going forward is the sense of focusing on what is positive. And the... the I, I often see a debate um, in uh, sort of Twitter feeds or just social media or whatever about people who are saying, um, who, who kind of critique false optimism. And I'm with that too. There's, there's a very big sort of techno optimist movement out there that basically tries to tell people, oh, we can kind of have it all. You know, we can keep growing and we just need to decouple technology and all this stuff. And, and that's not the kind of false optimism that I'm talking about. Um, to me, what's so exciting is this notion that there is truly a positive pathway um, that, but that that positive pathway involves a much deeper structural change than many people are willing to look at. And I saw, Carlos, in, in your chapter, I really liked how you, you described this notion of emergence and um, use this phrase, mostly a spontaneous process, uh, which could be accelerated through um, catalysis, like um, uh, through things that are catalyzing it, through pollination and fructification, that notion of um, spores from um, fungus, like actually going out there and, and kind of expanding out. And to me, this is crucial. And so I'd love to um, kind of hear your thoughts from both of you a little bit more about this notion of how we can set the conditions for emergence, because what we're saying, it's mostly a spontaneous process. What we also recognize from complex systems is that we can't control it. We can't like be top down and say, this is how it's going to be. And maybe 50 years ago or 70 years ago, the Mont Pelerin Society was more able to, because we lived in a society back then that was a little more top down oriented. We now live uh, for all the benefits and the flaws, we live in this kind of internet-based society uh, with its siloization, also with this democratization of ideas and the viral spread of ideas. So how can we set the conditions for this kind of emergence of new ways of thinking? And, and it's not just economics, isn't it? It's cultural. It's thinking in a completely different way about how we live our lives in this world. So. If it, if it, if it, let, me, let me start, and Carlos can then uh, uh, 
and his voice trick. I think the first thing we need to recognize is that there isn't one way. Mm -hmm. Because change that is needed is going to necessarily be different in most of the world where people feel the pain of being excluded from the current dominant system versus the position of people who are in the dominant uh, countries of Europe and North America who are enjoying the benefits of this current system. And so we need to start from there. We mustn't assume there is one universal way in which people are experiencing what's happening. Right. And I think that's where, again, we make a mistake. Yes. We need mm. to understand that we live in a pluriversal world, mm -hmm. not in a universal world. Mm -hmm. Second, even within most of the world, we need to look at who are the people who stand to benefit from the existing system versus those who will stand to benefit from the emergence of a new way of doing things. And so I live in a society, in, in a country, which by now we should have been a well-being, thriving constitutional democracy. We are not. Because again, in 1994, mm -hmm. People who were the equivalent of the Montpellier right. society made sure that in the negotiation process, there were items that protected the, the structures that generate the benefits to 10% of the population. Right. For so the exclusive neoliberal extractive economic system in South Africa was protected from transformation by putting in clauses like uh, property rights, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, this is again, like with the Club of Rome, the people who fought for freedom and mm -hmm. sacrificed so much were just grateful to see the end of the formal apartheid. Right. So, and what's happened in South Africa is that the new dispensation is acting like butlers of the socioeconomic system mm -hmm. we have inherited from colonial conquest, from apartheid. And so to have, to contemplate how a new way of being, a new civilization, might emerge in South Africa. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. have to use different lenses for the people who currently benefit versus those who don't, mm -hmm. but do it in a way that in the end, even those who are currently benefiting will recognize that inequality is expensive for both those who are poor and rich. Yes. But in our situation, and this is also what we are doing in the Club of Rome in terms of the emerging new civilizations explorations, we know that what works best is helping people from mm -hmm. preschool, those who are post-school, those who are adults to learn anew how to be human. Mm. To recognize that to be human is to be interconnected, interdependent. Yes. In my country, we use the expression Ubuntu. In the Buddhist mm -hmm. tradition, is called compassion. Mm -hmm. It is common. Human beings all over the world were designed for relatedness. We are right. at our happiest when we are in relationships that are positive. And yes. so for me, is how do we find a way of having those conversations that get people to recognize just what we are missing yeah. in the world by not living out our destiny yeah. of being a relational species.
Well, superbly said, Manfala. Thank you for that. And that is often, to me, one of the biggest sources of hope because it's as if, because we as humans evolved to want to be connected. So this dominant worldview that is based on separating us has to kind of condition everyone from birth to be to move away from their natural development. So all that's really needed is for people to reconnect with what they naturally want anyway. And I know. Um, you you had um, had shared uh, with us just a little bit earlier, Ma, Ma, um, Manfala, this Afrik Akili declaration um, of connectedness and inter, interdependence. And perhaps you could just uh, talk to us for a minute about that, because that seems to be to be indicative of the kind of reorientation that is needed that sets a top level awareness of something different that everyone can like bring into their own unique way to be part of. So do, do you just want to describe that to us a little yeah. bit? And we can put that and it's been incident in the chat right now. Thank you, Miriam. That declaration is an invitation to humanity, to the human community to say that we are one part of one family, the human family. And we, all of us, originate from Africa, my continent. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it has to be said in 2022 that people don't actually know that, it's not an accident. It is part of the suppression of the worth of most of the world so that they can be treated the way they've been treated mm -hmm. at conquest and then slavery and then now exploitation. And then you blame them. I mean, I often yeah. really shudder when I hear European countries like France and the UK and Germany and other places talking about how uh, people in, in, as they call it, the global South have to really get their act together and know that you know we 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 cannot keep supporting them when they've got such corrupt systems. Conquest, colonial conquest, is by its nature the most corrupt. They are the ones who introduce right. the corruption. Right. The idea right. that you can come and capture the assets and the resources, including. Mm -hmm the spiritual resources. I mean, now there's a big debate about the, the uh, artwork and the, the, mm -hmm. the many of the emotional and spiritual artifacts of Africa that are residing in the British Museum, in right. so many museums, so they need to go back. Mm -hmm. And going back, it's not that you are now deprived of them, but you know, in the same way that if you are a guest to a place, when you leave, the fact that they served you dinner in a lovely uh, uh, set doesn't mean you can take it away. Mm -hmm. You leave it there because mm -hmm. next time you come, you can enjoy it. So the Africa I kill this declaration is an invitation to the world, to mm -hmm. Africans in the first place, to have a shared view of how this mother continent not only birthed humanity, but birthed the first human civilization. Right. Again, yeah. we know that a lot of people think that those uh, uh, pyramids and the museums and the, the library of Alexandria are products of Arab world. They are products of African mm -hmm. intellectual exactly. wisdom and yeah. science and technology. Yeah. So that's important because then we take away the idea of superior and inferior mm -hmm. people. We are mm -hmm. one race, which is all originating from Africa. We, are look, we look different because the creator is a very artistic creator, doesn't want sameness. Mm -hmm. Like we don't want a flower garden with yellow roses only. And so we are very proud as the Club of Rome to be enablers of the emergence of that uh, declaration, which will be launched on the 8th of August, which is Indigenous Day globally, Wonderful. so that people can remember how to be Indigenous yeah. again.
That is great. Th thank you so much for, for sharing that with us here on the network, Manfala, today. And I also, I wanted to just point out that um, on the network, um, just a week or two ago, um, it was something that was shared was a, a, state, a similar kind of declaration coming from Australia of the Aboriginal peoples. And with the uh, vote, uh, um, the election in Australia, there is now a movement towards establishing that kind of declaration of the dignity um, and uh, looking to uh, the values of indigenous peoples in, in that continent as part of this reorientation, which is really exciting. So I'd like to turn now to you, Carlos, um, to f follow up on this. But before I do that, I just want to remind everyone in a few minutes, just about five minutes or so, we're gonna open up this conversation to the whole group. And so if you've got any questions, uh, reflections to add to the conversation that you'd like to, um, to share with the group, please have them ready. And then I'll ask you to click on that reactions um, button on the Zoom and choose the ha raise hands. And so you can actually, uh, we'll see you, so you can join in the conversation. And if somebody has a question, but you feel a little intimidated to be part of the big group, please put it in the chat and we'll try to uh, raise it up so we can ask it anyway. But um, I'd like to just turn to you, Carlos, to kind of follow up this um, way of thinking, because in your chapter, you talked about this kind of need for changes in our patterns of behavior and how we think. And I loved some, some point you were quoting Gandhi about the thing is it's, some people say, well, we don't have time for this kind of thing. And that quote from Gandhi as well, um, you know, it, there's no much point in being fast if we're moving fast in the wrong direction. So let's get our, re, our direction right first. And so I'd love to hear more of your thoughts of how we can build on exactly this kind of movement that Manfella was describing um, in that global reorientation of our, of our worldview, basically. Well, it's difficult to speak after my dear friend Mampella, she's so eloquent, you know, <laughs> but I will try to add a few drops of, uh, about what we are trying to do. And, and just to, to show how different is the nature of what we are doing compared to what the Mount Pelerin Society did. You know? right. They were basically closing the space of possibilities. Mm -hmm. down, down to that famous sentence by Mrs. Thatcher, there is no alternative, <laughs> Tina. We are exactly doing the opposite, you know? And based on all threads of knowledge uh, and paying tribute to all uh, sources of wisdom and knowledge from all cultures, all worldviews. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because right. all that is part of humanity and it's not, we are not in, in the mood of universalism, we are in the mood of pluriversalism or pluriversality. Mm -hmm recognizing that there are many different worldviews. One has taken a lot of influence in the last centuries, which is the worldview, if you wish, of modernism with a capital M, mm -hmm. um, connected so much, you know, to a limited uh, version of science. Right. You know, the part of science which was useful to legitimize power and to and to be and to create new uh, new weaponry by the way i mean mm -hmm. starting by that you know yeah and yeah. reinforce power and ignoring all other uh, threads of knowledge but also of science so what we are doing what we started doing in in 2018 uh, 50th anniversary of the club of rome itself of the organization mm -hmm. uh, we asked ourselves many questions and i think we tried uh, we started experimenting with some responses. One uh, is, uh, has definitely been validated by experience, which was electing two ladies, Mampela and uh, Sandrine Dixon de Cleve as co-presidents, which right. was already a strong sign of uh, a new club of Rome in the 21st mm -hmm. century. But mm -hmm. especially we are building on, uh, I would say the, the best of system thinking, the most advanced, and the most advanced means the closest to life. Mm -hmm. You know, how far has modern science gone into understanding better how life works? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so yes, we have an issue with the way we think uh, pretty much in the sense that Gregory Bateson said, 
said, you know, the biggest issues in the world come from the difference between how people think and how nature works. Right. <clears throat> but we know actually much more and since a very long time about how nature works than mm -hmm. we use in our societal arrangements right now. Yes. So what we are trying, uh, and this is again uh, described in a way in the in limits and beyond this new report, if people are looking for uh, clear recipes, you know, uh, ready-made recipes, they are not there because this is not the process. Mm -hmm. The process is to open our, open our mindsets, open our mindsets to other perspectives and other perspectives from other feminist perspective, Asian, different Asian perspectives, uh, thinking about the future, etc. But in particular to this process of learning, uh, of deep uh, learning, of opening the, the mindset. Just an anecdote for you and for the, the audience. Mm -hmm. right. uh, last, week, last week we were in, in Brussels uh, organizing a number of events on, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Limits mm -hmm. of Growth. And in particular, we had a meeting with around 10 members of the European Parliament. Uh, and 10 members who were quite well, um, who, were, who were receiving us warmly and welcoming, you know, and recognizing the value of the limits of growth and the value of the ideas that the Club of Rome has been promoting. And uh, I was struck by, by uh, the paradox of recognizing the value of the ideas, recognizing that we need the big paradigm shift, uh, new visions, you know, new hopeful visions of what, what well-being means redefining well-being and at the same time one of them said uh, but we have no time to think mm. we mm. have no time to think isn't that terrible so yes. many people are stuck are in mental jails yeah the first step of mm -hmm. what we are doing now mm -hmm. is and we just started a new problem program of activities called the fifth element mm -hmm. why the fifth element because the fifth element is life in ancient right. traditions, you know, in many ancient traditions, the fifth element is life and we have to learn from life. But the, thing, the first thing it looks we have to learn mm -hmm. is how do we liberate ourselves from the mental jails where we are and where yes. even the most powerful mm -hmm. quote unquote people, I mean, members of the European Parliament say we have no, no time to think, they are in mental jails. We are in mm -hmm. mental jails. And for that, um, I must say we are really, it's an exciting moment of building, again, weaving different threads of knowledge and wisdom, including the experiences mm -hmm. from what I would call the pedagogies of liberation. Right. Wow. You know, including, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. including the foundations for the Black Consciousness Movement mm -hmm. that uh, Mampele initiated in South Africa in the early 70s. Right. Right. Uh, and the realization that, well, everybody is capable. We have to bet on the humanity of everybody. Everybody is capable. The first step is to get out of the sense of helplessness, mm -hmm. that there is no alternative and we are not capable and somebody else exactly. has to decide for us. Beautifully said. Thank you. Thank you. And in a moment now, um, thank you to those who have uh, put your hands up and we, we, we can turn to this um, this broader conversation. And as we do so, as we turn to that, I just wanted to um, kind of uh, follow on from what you were just saying, Carlos, about this notion of looking to life itself. And something that has so energized me, and I know a lot of people in this group, and I know that David Corton is, is one of the people in the, um, who's, who's joined this meeting right now today, this notion of an ecological civilization, of actually this kind of broad vision um, of learning from life itself and looking at what civilization could look like if it were based on the principles that ecosystems themselves have developed over millions of years that work so well. So that's something that I feel gives a sense of a broad vision that like almost a top-down uh, sense to the system. So that can be interpreted in a million different diverse ways in different groups. So we don't, it's not like one size fits all, but it opens up this umbrella that all of us can be part of moving towards that. So it's something I'm excited about. Maybe we can talk a little more about that before the end of this session, but let's turn 
to uh, Tony first, um, who had his um, hand up first. If you want to join our conversation with a question, Tony, thank you. Welcome. And we need to get you off mute, Tony. Okay, is, is that, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a, a fanatic and a mad fan about Ubuntu, mm. uh, because when we put Ubuntu in its ecological sense, we are species through other species. And mm. that is the way we have to learn and place we have to learn. And we learn somologically, we embody the knowledge mm. we encounter and as we live. So we say that living is learning. And when we look at the total amount of learning and knowing and understanding that's going on on this planet, a tiniest incountable fraction of it takes place didactically in classrooms and in schools. Every species and all of us actually learn in the wild, mm -hmm. in ecosystems, by reading the books of nature and understanding that. Mm -hmm. And our biggest problem is that uh, we've gone away from our Socratic somatic way of learning, somological way of learning. Mm -hmm. And we have for the past 2000 years mm -hmm. uh, been stuck in uh, Cartesian dualism and didactic teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, this has destroyed education. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm rather convinced that Socrates uh, understood that we are heading for this 2000 years of uh, bad schooling uh, and decided to drink the hemlock to get out of it. Uh, we, we, we totally need to return to the way that we learn naturally. And that is to right. immerse ourselves in our ecosystems mm -hmm. and to learn embodied and through and with every other species. Yes. And that is the most important uh, issue in my opinion. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Tony. I don't know if Manfell or Carlos, anything you wanted to add to that? Or... Uh, if, I, if I may just add another, another drop of tribute to the women <clears throat> system thinkers, I've seen a comment mm -hmm. on that in the chat. Uh, the, the very last uh, paper by Donella Meadows, mm. you know, who was the, the leading author of the Limits to Growth right. uh, with Dennis and the, and the rest, uh, her very last paper was titled Dancing with Systems. Yeah. She realized she has an incredible intellectual evolution. I mean, who knows where she would be nowadays. Unfortunately, she passed away too, mm -hmm. way too early. She had an in incredible intellectual evolution starting from a more mechanistic perspective of, of systems and right. systems thinking to this idea of it's about dancing. It's yes. about learning is mm. living and learning uh, involves all our human capacities yeah the conscious and the unconscious so. beautiful yeah yeah thank you and, Tony, and i love very much oh. your idea about living is learning and mm. your reference to socrates because one of the uh, emerging knowledges that are being uh, excavated from uh, the history of North Africa is how the Greeks learned from Africans mm -hmm. about how to learn in this kind of embodied way, because the old uh, e Egyptian priests who look like me used to just sit and watch and learn from nature. They didn't have telescopes, mm -hmm. but they learned about the stars, etc. And we need to return to that way of learning, learning from our ecosystem. So your ecological civilization, uh, Jeremy, is, a, is an apt uh, point for discussion. Mm, great. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for, for bringing that question of learning in, Tony. That's great. And let's turn to Stephanie. Uh, I, I so appreciate what you're sharing. It's very inspiring. At least in the United States, there's a tension that arises from learning from indigenous people versus them feeling like it's being appropriated from them. Mm. And it seems like you all have found a way to kind of both honor and draw that line. But I wondered what kind of wisdom you all share about how to create the right balance. Mm. Great question. Manfella, Carlos, anything you want to uh share on that? I can only say that 
uh, we are assisted a great deal mm -hmm. by young people, including my own son, who have done the excavating of their mm -hmm. own heritage. And I think coming from parents who were thrashing about in the wild and helped by people like Franz Fanon and, and, uh, um, and other West African intellectuals to really understand that we come from greatness. And this greatness is a world heritage. And, and the denial of this heritage is what's putting the world at risk. And you, I mean, as an African coming to North America and seeing indigenous people that I can just see, I mean, there's, there's so much commonality. And even now, I mean, Carlos and I were uh, sharing uh, material coming from China. Ancient China also had similar ways of which you could say this philosophy of interconnectedness that I cannot improve on my own without making sure that everybody improves because that way then you've got a, a momentum. So I think there is a huge opportunity for humanity in the 21st century with the planetary emergencies around us to go back to the beginning, learn how to learn anew. And the beauty is that people like you and others are the channels of ancient wisdom that we need to bring into these conversations. Mm. Mm. If, if, I, if I may, Stephanie, you use the key word, appropriation. Mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, we have to be extremely cautious about falling into that trap. Um, the way we deal with that is by having real conversations, which are not <laughs> always easy, with people um, from indigenous cultures, but also from what is called the global south, because those are who have the sensitivity, the real sensitivity on appropriation. Too often in, in the West, in the Western countries, uh, we fall into the trap of, oh, now, okay, let's find out what are the recipes for regeneration <laughs> from indigenous cultures, Let's convert them, their knowledge into something explicit, <clears throat> decontextualized. Let's transform that into recipes that we can, you know, put a stamp on them and transform into something which can go to the market. Mm -hmm. This is obviously the continuation of the same colonial adventure. And, and this is needless to say the wrong way. So we need, uh, for instance, in our case, we work with a network of ladies uh, led by Samantha Supia from the Global South called um, Possible Futures. Mm -hmm. They talk about planetary regenerative goals, you know, instead of the SDGs, planetary regenerative goals. And mm -hmm. that's where we learn from how not to be how not to fall, continuing, continue to fall in the colonialist uh, mm -hmm. trap, mm -hmm. which is so easy to fall into. Mm. Wow. Thank you very much. Very helpful. That's great. And one thing I would just add is just a shout out to, I, I see that Wahing Petopa has been sharing a couple of links in the chat. Uh, Wahing Petopa, um, also known as Four Arrows, and Dasha Narvaez, uh, co-wrote and co-edited this book called Restoring the Indigenous Worldview. And we had a conversation like this last month on the network on just this topic. And so just um, people can find the recording on that on the network if they want to uh, look a little more deeply into those, this question. Thank you for raising that, Stephanie. And let's turn to Jesse. Uh, you want to uh, share your question or perspective, Jesse? On mute here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, originally a physicist, and, uh, and when I started discovering that uh, uh, people were having trouble with the limits to growth uh, um, as an idea and, and what to do about it, I, I, uh, I discovered that science generally is modeled to study things controlled from the outside, 
and growth is and, and other living things are systems that are designed and controlled from the inside. Mm. So I decided to change what I was my learning approach. I started studying designs of things. I studied contexts. I studied uh, uh, cues and and responses that uh, <clears throat> all sorts of simple systems have wonderfully sophisticated uh, self-organization uh, and uh, adaptation responses, uh, for example, and certainly we do. And and there's a, a and, and that led to discovering a, a universal pattern uh, that nature uses and we use extensively <laughs> too, hidden in plain sight uh, for, uh, uh, resolving growth crises, um, and that's to take the resources that we use for building up uh, for innovations uh, from an innovation. We start start making a a way to use it, and then we turn the resource instead of expanding it further and further to adapting it to the world, mm -hmm. and and we do that well in the womb. We we, we multiply a seed of life to a, a fully formed but highly undeveloped human being. And mm -hmm. then we spend 20 years uh, uh, slowly nurturing it and helping it find its way. And uh, as its body matures and, and reaches a peak of, of uh, vitality and endurance and longevity. Um, and, and we could use that same model uh, for the uh, economic system, if we could only figure out what parts are doing doing that, or where where the signal needs to come from and go to, and mm -hmm. and there's, it, it, it's a funny, another funny thing, very much hidden in sight, is that the 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 cream of the crop of humanity, the the highly educated, successful managers of all all our systems are generally very open, uh, engaging, well-informed, uh, risk-averse, uh, family-centered uh, uh, and, and community-supporting uh, people who need to learn that for our civilization to survive, they need to start using the resource to take care of the world rather than multiply their extraction from it. Mm. And, uh, uh, it's a transformative thing that that needs to happen for the system as a whole. If you just change one part, the system will correct that part. Right. Uh, yeah. you, so the question is, how do we change that huge community of wonderfully endowed humanity, mm -hmm. wealthy, uh, knowledgeable, talented as can be in making things work? <laughs> we can inspire them to change change their mode of thinking. Yes, how do we? Um, I don't know, Manfello, Carlos, if you have any... No, I, uh, I think okay. I'll leave it to Carlos. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> that's, a, that's an easy question, right? Um, so our approach is... Our approach is that kind of change actually happens. So this is also what it is behind this idea of emerging new civilizations. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I mean, in, again, in 2018, we said, uh, well, you know, it's not a matter of shifting from fossil fuels to renewable energies. What we're talking about is much deeper. And anyway, every time humanity has changed its basic metabolism, has changed its main sources of energy, that has meant a change in civilization. So we are in the process of shifting from the civilization or civilizations of modernity to something else. But how, how does it work? We don't know. Let's yeah. recognize we don't know. Oh, no, uh, uh, there, there is no, much, no, no. There is no, no, much but, better yeah. understanding of what, what needs yes, to happen. I, what actually yeah, yeah, drives the decision-making of the, of the yeah, economy but, is yes, finance. But let me, finish. Energy. let me finish. I said before, we know a lot, actually, much more about how, how life works and how evolution works and how complexity works 
than uh, we use in our social care arrangements, but we don't know how to create the emergence in a straightforward manner. Mm -hmm. this, uh, we don't know, and we will probably never know because we are part of life. Can we, as a part of life, understand in the whole? Probably not. So mm -hmm. the critical issue is that those people you were mentioning, uh, Jesse, are uh, those who are probably more stuck in their, act, in their current mindsets. Mm -hmm. So, and the point is, let's try with them because it's not true that it is impossible to, to we people, people, real people have created the conditions for mindset shifts yeah. on many occasions, mm -hmm. in many yeah. places, uh, often unseen. And probably it's better that they are unseen, but you go to, and, and you have to look probably in most of the world, not in the Western world, where mm -hmm. we are more stuck in our ways of thinking, mm -hmm. Of course, because we are mostly the, the beneficiaries mm -hmm. of the situation and the distribution of power in the world. So if we are the beneficiaries, you know, you might have the feeling that you should, we should change, but mm -hmm. it's a very comfortable position, you know, of, oh, we should change, yeah. but, you know, we are so well and we don't have time to think, so we don't change. Well, the so best way. Well, thanks for that. Let me just in, like interrupt this a uh, dialogue right now, it, it, just because I see there's a, a number of people with their with their right. hands up still who want to share. Yeah. But, yeah. But, I, but I do I want to just, just point uh, out that uh, uh, Jessie has done fantastic research in this area, and I, I've seen that she's already um, put some links in the chat to some of her work, important work. And so I do encourage people to to click on those links. And take a read of what Jess is offering, you know, and engage in dialogue with her on, on the network. Because I, I, I really appreciate, Jesse, that you raise one of the toughest questions there is to answer and that you have some thoughts on how to approach that. So, so thank you for that. And just turning to Derek now, who has um, who's been waiting with his hand up. Right. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for putting this um this event together today and uh, i enjoyed your book the patterning reason uh patterning instinct and um uh, and i enjoyed uh the limits to, if if that's the right word the limits to growth right back in 1972 and the two follow-up uh to that and i've got great admiration for the club of rome in uh, furthering this conversation in the world. And uh, as you said earlier on, uh, the, the Limits to Growth book uh, gave 12 scenarios out of the computer model that, that had been created, uh, 11 of which were, were probably uh, quite hopeful and one of which was uh, pretty gloomy, uh, which was the reference run. And we've been running on the reference run ever since. And we now seem to be running into the wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, 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 my own position is that we're on a knife edge. Uh, right. It could go either way. And uh, it's still possible that we could make a transition into a world that really works for everybody. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for, for sharing that, Derek. And yeah, I think we're all sensing, yes, we're on that knife edge. And this is the key question. What can we do to shift the orientation towards that life affirming future? So yeah, thanks for that. And uh, Terry, would you like to share a question? Or? Good evening, uh, and I wanted to engage with uh, Mampel. Mm -hmm. Mampel, I would like you to uh, explain the phenomenon of transformation through our African greeting system of Saubon. Mm. You know, Saubon, that if you could explain the rest of the non-African in particular, the way Saubona changes completely another person towards transforming everything with yourself and with the rest. 
one. And then uh, Carlos, um, uh, puede hablar un poquito de español. <laughs> okay, estaba, estaba no, a terminamiento en Cuba. Uh, Muy bien. My question, my question to you, Carlos, is something very difficult, but in South Africa is a very difficult question to deal with. And in uh, South America is uh, Partido de México, que se llama Moreno, Moreno. And then in South Africa, you've got all sorts of names like colored, uh, you know, in South America, mestizos, mulatas, et cetera, et cetera. And I wanted to ask you, Carlos, how does that mixity in terms of our evolution and in our consciousness is going to be affecting, not affecting, but enhancing transformation when you come from various, uh, various um, influence and you're living it through your, you know, the Moreno, Mixito, Mestizo, Khaled, Mixtic, and all these kinds of things. So that's the two questions that I have. One is Mampela is about Saubona, greeting, and how can we change the world and transform the world by greeting? Mm. And Carlos about mixing. <laughs> great, great. Thanks. So let's send you okay. Manfella. Yes. Uh, in fact, the two questions are linked. Mm. Because Absolutely. Sao born means I see you and you are me, I am you. And if that's the approach, it's like a red rose when it sees a yellow rose doesn't say, how do I live with this yellow rose? No, it embraces it. But we have created systems that deliberately humiliate and undermine the worth of others, simply because they've got different texture hair, different color, etc. And it started not because people were confused, People from the uh, northern cold climes appreciated the black or darker skinned people. It is only because they needed to find an excuse for extracting and, ex and depriving others. Then you mm -hmm. call them other. You other people for a purpose. But when you say Saubon, you are inviting people into your presence, mm. into, as someone was saying, we learn through the embodiment of the experiences that we have. And this is much, much more important in terms of our humanity. Our humanity is, is impossible to be human alone. Humanity by its definition is relational. You cannot be a human being unless other human beings affirm your humanity. So in African languages, Isizuru is the one that says Saubon. In different languages, it's the same ethos. And total strangers will then go the, to the next step and say, how are you? So the well-being of everybody is important because you can only be well as a human being if others are well. Carlos. Well, obviously mixing is uh, an essential part of the response, um, but starting by getting us out of blind spots that some people think it exists something, some form of human life which is not mixed. If we investigate all ethnicities, all places, the history, the long time history of any place, uh, for instance, of the UK, you will find out that it's a country which has been populated over the over very long periods by different uh, waves of people coming from different places. So there is no purity, you know, in 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 humanity. Nothing like that, you know. It's a it's a blind spot. It's a fantasy, of course, and a very dangerous one. And, but let me just emphasize one aspect. We have to forget about this idea of one world, you know, because this is a sort of neo-colonial perspective of 
trying to find a fake uh, unity, but basically from the perspective of the dominant powers and countries, mm -hmm. as if uh, something which can be a response in a place in New York or, uh, or in Paris or whatever could be a recipe for response to the all of humanity everywhere. Mm. This is why we insist so much uh, along, uh, you know, the, there's a French philosopher who says that the universal is always the universal of somebody. Yeah. Let's talk about mixing and pluriversality. And it's not an easy task because pluriversality means that you have to accept that old worldviews, the worldviews which are so different from so different mm -hmm. cultures are all legitimate. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that you, you abandon your own worldview, not saying that, just saying that we have to respect mm -hmm. all others, not yeah. consider them as underdeveloped or anything yeah. like that. Well said, Carlos. Thank you so much. And um, one, one concept I just look like to put in that mix is this notion of um, integration, which to me is so key because it's how all living systems work, which is really about unity with differentiation. Every living system works so well because every part is, is uniquely designed to do its part completely specialized, but also part of something bigger. So it contributes to the whole while it's focusing on its particular skills. That's what I believe we need in that exactly what you're describing, Carlos. So thank you. And let's turn, I'm just aware that we're in the last 10 minutes now. So let's kind of focus our questions and our, our responses. Let's turn to Don. Um, and uh, hi, Don, what, what do you have to share or ask? We need to get you off mute. Okay, great. Um, we're still not hearing you actually, Don, even though you're off mute on the Zoom. Uh, still, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. we heard you, we can okay. hear you. Okay, my headset is just not working, so I'll put that to yeah, one side. Okay. So thank mm -hmm. you very much everybody for the, uh, the conversation and all the points made so far. Um, like my interest is really in the the movements that are active right now in attempting to create change. Um, so you know, I've been involved in a number of sort of activist movements, Extinction Rebellion, various climate movements. There's a lot of energy that's there, and my belief is that a lot of there are a lot of people throughout society who are aware that something is seriously off, yeah. and what seems to be missing is a consistent narrative rather than rebelling against that we are rebelling towards something. So mm -hmm. I'm really interested in creating or finding a way of sort of creating, articulating, um, getting that kind of new story viral out there. I've been very interested in work by people like George Monbiot with his um, um, the book, you know, Out of the Wreckage. And that really led me to your work, Jeremy, as well. So I'm interested in that narr narrative because I think there's been a lot of energy like in the Occupy movement, Extinction Rebellion, where we know something's off, we need to advocate for change. People are willing to put their bodies on the line. Here in British Columbia, we've had mm -hmm. 1,200 arrested people attempting to um, you know, stop the, the destruction of the last old growth forest we have mm -hmm. here. Um, but what I find in a lot of these movements is it seems that this piece of interconnection is missing that there's, um, we're very good at dividing and conquering amongst ourselves because that is kind of the colonial ethos that we live within. So I'm curious if people have any views on what are the kind of cultural tipping points that we need to push on that are mm. actually going to generate the change? Great question. Thanks. Manfella, Carlos, any thoughts on that? Great question. But all I can say is it requires consciousness, which is takes us back to learning by living what we are aspiring to. As young students in South Africa, for example, in the Black Consciousness Movement, what united us was a desire for a future that we could be proud of. And we understood that the different colors, so-called colored African, whatever, 
they were divide and conquer tactics. So mm -hmm. we actually promoted solidarity and reached out to those white people who were part of, or wanted to be part of the liberation of South Africa into a shared prosperous constitutional democracy. Unfortunately for us, post-1994, we got people who were not part of that movement in charge, going, taking us right back to the division. So in South Africa, we still have population classification. Ridiculous. But that's what happens when you lose sight of the vision. So I agree with you 100% on the story. We need a consistent story, narrative, by which we can live of a globe of global equity for a healthy planet. And that can manifest everywhere in different forms. And mm -hmm. so, and I see here my friend and, and mentor, David Courts, and he's a man of change the story, change the narrative, and then you can see progress. So I think we should ask him to come in. That sound, so, sounds great. Let's welcome David to the um, spotlight here. Welcome, David. And David is also um, an author of a recent paper taking that theme of emergency to emergence um, on the, the vision of an ecological civilization. And one of the leading thinkers in that area that I've been totally inspired by over the last few years. So uh, thanks for joining the conversation, David. And let's turn to you for your thoughts on that. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, this is such a wonderful session. And I so appreciated uh, Don's observation, um, <clears throat> the importance of getting beyond what we're against to focus on what we are for, where we want to go. Um, and that, of course, is why both of you and I are so focused on this frame of an ecological civilization, which I understand is going to be the name of your next book. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that it conveys this sense of deep transformation on a civilizational scale. Mm -hmm. And it helps us recognize perhaps that what we have called civilization really has not been civilized. Mm. And what we're talking about here is, <laughs> is in a sense becoming civilized in the sense in which that was understood by the Earth's earliest people uh, coming from Africa. Mm -hmm. Now, the, what we call civilization has been organization from the top down, mm. organizing as empires, kingdoms, and now transnational corporations, mm -hmm. but all with structures that centralize power and control. Now, what we're learning is that life, by its very nature, organizes from the bottom up. Yeah. It's a totally different process. And essentially, what we need to do is learn to live. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a radical idea. <laughs> Living beings learning to live. Boy. Now, of course, life is extremely complicated. It organizes from the bottom up, and it has very definite competitive, competitive aspects. I mean, many of us have to eat each other. If we don't eat animals and, and, and vegetables, we can't survive. That's part of life. But so we get so caught up on that competitive aspect that we forget the deeper, the deeper dynamic of deep interdependence and deep cooperation. And what we need to work from work with now is recognizing that we have to shift power into local communities mm -hmm. that are caring for one another and their place on earth, but also doing it with the recognition, this is not about communities competing with each other, but communities working together, cooperating and sharing particularly sharing information, sharing learning together. And it's a wholly different process from what we have been accustomed to. Now, all of this needs to be supported by higher system levels, but that is very different from higher system levels seeking to control the local levels in order to 
control and exploit both the people and the resources of a living earth. Mm. So wow. just wanted to throw that. Throw yeah, that, throw thank that. you so much. And that's, um, and um, Manfell and Carlos, I don't know if you have any closing words um, in relation to that and to our topic as a whole. And let me just add, I, I, I'm afraid, Brian, I think we're, we've run out of time. We may not have time for your question. I appreciate you've been waiting there patiently. But once again, I'll remind everyone, we're going to put this recording of this conversation up on the network. And I invite you, Brian, and anyone else who's got other questions to put that in the conversation. And we'll ask Manfella and Carlos if they want to um, connect with any answers and continue the conversation online on the network. So, um, but let me just turn to you, Manfella and Carlos, for any closing words, and then I'll, I'll close our session today. I believe that what we have been discussing today, particularly this issue of learning by living and thinking about the kind of civilization that emerges, Burma, there is no recipe because it's got to evolve into its place. Mm -hmm. And of course, by telling one another narratives of hope, but also holding one another accountable, we can in fact move away from being against something to being for mm -hmm. a planet where there is equity and well being for all, and where there is abundance. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Manfella. And uh, Carlos, you want to add any final Yeah, word? I just wanted to add a bit of emphasis of, because I've seen a comment on in the chat about studying how to change the system. Mm -hmm. I, I would add a bit of emphasis on uh, beware of conscious purpose, beware of the usual approach of uh, pretending that we are observing the system from outside and we can find, you know, mm. the, rough, mm. the roadmap in 10 easy steps to change because we are able to beware of the concept of leverage points, even mm. if that comes from Dana Meadows, mm. it's still very mechanistic. Yeah. Living mm. systems are something else. Living systems learn change by learning new mm. patterns. Yeah. And what that means depends so much on the context, because there might be some universal principles behind life, uh, for sure, some principles of physics, of chemistry, etc. Mm -hmm. But the manifestations of life are completely unique and completely diverse and completely contextual. So what makes sense to do here, I mean, here I am in Spain, mm -hmm. you are in the USA, uh, that's already completely different. What makes sense to do in China, that might be completely different. What mm -hmm. commonality I see is that we really have to go into that process of liberation of our mindsets, of mm -hmm. our mental jails, <clears throat> yeah. to, you know, to open that potential for learning we all have, individually and collectively. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's so, so profound, Carlos. Thank you. And, and the only thing I'd add is that, and I think the, the shared sense, whether it's in China, Africa, United States or elsewhere, is moving towards a vision of a life-affirming society, a life-affirming civilization for all. And that's something that I think all these movements for transformation share. Um, and um, really just want to thank you so much and really point out that this conversation, this kind of conversation, what we're doing, is that change we're talking about. It's not just talking about the change, we are the change. And, exactly. um, and the, the future that we want is not something out there. We are futuring, it's a verb that we're all doing with this conversation, thinking in these ways, taking these ideas, putting it out there. We're all part of that transformation right now as we speak, which is why I'm so grateful to all of you who have joined today and, and shared your thoughts and perspectives. And just want to add a, a, just a couple of things like here on the network. L later today, in fact, David uh, was talking about moving to that localization. Um, and actually, um, there's going to be a webinar that you can sign up for on the, on the network, where I'll be in conversation with 
um, Joanna Macy and Helena Norberg Hodge about a brand new film that's actually launching today called Planet Local, A Quiet Revolution. Just a great awe-inspiring uh, documentary looking at um, thinkers from around the world, and not just thinkers, but doers, actually bringing this quiet revolution of localization into our reality. So um, if you're able to, it's at 5 p.m., Pacific time, and you can click uh, join it on on uh, by going to the network. And just a reminder: in two weeks from now, exactly two weeks on July fifth, we'll be having another one of our monthly Deep Transformation Network members uh, meetings, where again we'll join online and uh, we'll use this network as a way to exactly move this kind of transformation forward that we need. Thank you so much, Manfella and Carlos. This has been an inspiring and a mind expanding conversation for me and I know for everyone here. So until next time, thank you all. Bye. Thank you thank to you. all of you. Thank, thank you. Care. Thank you, Jeremy.